Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the Korean Peninsula. This episode was produced in cooperation and with the support of the East Asian Study Center at The Ohio State University. China is a key player on the Korean Peninsula. It is not only North Korea's sole ally, but has also become South Korea's most important trading partner. Yet, the relationship it has with both Korean states is fraught with tension. Beijing's hold over Pyongyang has been weakening under the rule of Kim Jong-un, and Seoul's alliance with Washington seems to be at odds with Chinese interest. To understand the relationships China has with both Koreas, we sat down with Professor John Delury. We talked about China's place in the world and its evolution under the leadership of Xi Jinping, its relationship with South Korea during the Moon administration, and with Kim Jong-un's North Korea, and about the role the United States plays in these relations. John Delury is Professor of Chinese Studies at Yonsei University's Graduate School of International Studies in Seoul. He completed his undergraduate and graduate studies in history at Yale University. He wrote, together with Orville Schell, Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century, which was published in 2013. Professor Delory's works have appeared in various publications, including Foreign Affairs, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and Asian Survey. Professor Delory, welcome to Korea and the World. For the second time, actually, since we already spoke to you five years ago in 2016. I'm so glad we're both still around, Alan, to talk again. I'm really happy to do this. Today, we want to talk to you about China, and in particular, about what China means to the Korean Peninsula. But first, let's go back a decade. In 2013, you published, together with Orville Schell, a book on China and its recent history, Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century. In the final pages of the book, you wondered whether China, after it gained the wealth and power you referred to in the title, would also be able to find international respect and admiration. So from today's perspective, almost a decade later, did China get any closer to the international respect and admiration that you wrote about back then? Well, what a great question as professors always like to say, and it's interesting to go back to that moment. You know, we were writing that book as Xi Jinping was coming into power. So, you know, of course we knew she was coming, but I think Orville too would agree we didn't anticipate a lot of key features that would emerge in what we call the Xi era. Historically, I almost would say it's been more interesting, you know, and I discuss with my students in teaching modern Chinese history and also U.S.-China relations, you know, each year we kind of look at this question of Xi's China and is it sort of a coherent era in Chinese history like Deng's China really is and Mao's China is? Is this almost the third era of PRC history? And I, I guess each year it seems more and more to be the case and especially as most analysts of you know, elite politics think she is going to hang on, then that will strengthen his claim to his own era even more. But you know, that issue you raise that we were thinking about in 2013 about admiration, and I think we had someone in mind, in particular, uh, Liang Qichao, the early 20th century Chinese public intellectual, who in a, in a funny way is kind of a hero, I think, in that book, because Liang Qichao raised that question, you know, about okay, if we, we get wealth and power, but isn't there a third thing we also need? And uh, the book ended, the last chapter was not on Xi Jinping, it was on Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and dissident, who subsequently died in prison. And Liu Xiaobo raised that question, you know, in the late 20th century. And at that point, China as a nation had achieved already extraordinary progress toward wealth and power, which has continued. And Liu Xiaobo asked, what about the third thing? What do we stand for? How do we treat one another as human beings? You know, what are our values? Now, in 2021, I can think of some counterexamples where parts of the world hold aspects of what China is able to do in esteem and admiration and model themselves to some extent. But that's primarily the model is here's a way to, to achieve wealth and power. It's not for really a set of values. And then I can think of plenty of other examples where really, I would say from the standards of modern Chinese history, the country has gone backwards in terms of, it's always been pretty repressive, but the political repression has gone worse. There's always been conflicts uh, with ethnic minorities 
but what's happened to Uyghurs in Xinjiang, Tibetans in Tibetan areas has gotten, it's all gotten worse. Hong Kong situation, worse. I think from a perspective of humanely treating Chinese people, people in China, and then also to your question from the perspective of international admiration. I, I think you're hard pressed to argue that the world's admiration for China has kept pace with the increase in its national wealth and power over the last decade. You allude to the possibility of a, of a Xi era. What would be the characteristics of, this, of these times? Well, um, this is what we try to work out over the course of a semester. So there's no short answer to this, but elements of it would include, you know, for one thing, political economy has been so important. It's important everywhere, but China has its unique, unique trajectory of political economy and how it's dealt with the balance between state and market. Going from the early days, Mao's China is characterized by an attempt to almost eliminate market forces, you know, working off initially a kind of orthodox Stalinist model, the command economy, but then moving into its own form of Maoist economic development, rapid economic development, but all under the control of a revolutionary state. And so you, in terms of balance in state and market, you had the same goal of eliminating the market. And that characterizes a lot of what's going on in Mao and creates the contrast with Deng, because the revolution, you know, the kind of second revolutionary turn under Deng is to recalibrate that. And of course, we all know this story through what was called reform and opening up, you know, to allow uh, market forces to sort of do their magic while retaining a lot of state control. And that was the part that we'd say in retrospect, probably say American analysts missed because there was this expectation, okay, Deng's China means liberalization, you know, and so that framework of liberalizing. And it was also the idea was Deng is liberalizing the political economy. And there were elements of that. You look at the 1980s, there was a lot of political liberalization happening. So it, it wasn't fanciful. It was rooted in things that were happening. But as it turned out, and I, I think now, you know, one of the key features of the Xi era is maybe the next recalibration. You know, now, of course, there are these market forces at play. And China's integrated into a global economy, which at a certain level is driven by global capitalist forces, has companies, you know, and they have degrees of autonomy. And yet, in the balance of state and market, the emphasis since she came in has been on strengthening the state, the levers of control of the state, and really sort of pausing the momentum that progress toward reform has, you know, pretty much stopped. There were, it was already slowing down when he came in. Instead, the focus has been on a strong state, state control over the market, a strong party. And then I guess the other big difference with the Deng era is the role of Xi himself. You know, this emergence of, and I'm not sure we have the right term for it, a strong man doesn't quite capture it. Even though we can describe the era as Deng's China, one thing Deng was trying to do was not be Mao. He didn't want to dominate everything the way Mao dominated everything. And he had a very difficult time with this. But from the minute he moved in in the late 70s, he was focused on succession and who's going to come after him, you know, and transferring over power. Whereas, of course, Xi has been focused on more Xi, you know, and we still don't know a successor. It would appear there's, there's not going to be one. So he's broken the kind of 10-year term limit. Of course, that was, there was a formal constitutional revision a revision of Deng's constitution of the 1980 amendment, allowing Xi to stay on as president. So the whole question of how the paramount leader relates to the party, I would say that's a fundamental change. You know, the way Deng approached it, and Deng really set the mold that was then followed by Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, that mold has been broken. We don't know what's going to happen, but Xi has a, a different mold in mind. And it would appear with the support of the party. I mean, the party seems to like Xi. I don't think Xi uh, represents this um, violent takeover of the CCP. Like you could say Donald Trump was this kind of takeover of the Republican Party. My sense is it's quite different. You know, Xi is a creature of the CCP. The party wanted this kind of strong single ruler. There's a lot of dissatisfaction by the end of the Hu Jintao era. So, that creates a very different dynamic than what we had gotten used to during the decades of Deng. But it's also not a return to Mao. 
the parallels to Mao are, in my view, fairly superficial. You know, when you keep pursuing them, it doesn't work that well. She is fundamentally a very different political creature from Mao. Opinion surveys show that negative perceptions of China in other countries are more widespread today than at any other point in the last two decades. How do you explain that? Is it due to this Xi factor? Well, Alan, you're you're the expert on public opinion surveys, and I take it with a big grain of salt when we're told, you know, China is popular or unpopular. Take South Korea, the country that I've been living in for the last decade. You know, views here are really complicated toward China. And if you just work off an annual survey, okay, fine, you know, they've been asking the same question to n number of people every year for the last 20 years. And that can be a useful indicator, but it's a very crude indicator of what might be going on. So caveat with that, that you really have to look within each public and understand the complexity of the, of the views. So I'm a little hesitant to generalize, but as we were discussing at the beginning about when you asked, has international admiration increased? You know, I think that some of this survey data does bear out my instinctive answer, which is no. And there's a lot, let's break it down at least to here in this region in Northeast Asia and to some extent in the Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia, Oceania a bit. You know, China is, I would say, increasingly seen as somewhere along the line, the spectrum from assertive to aggressive. It, it's, a, it's a kind of natural process from a realist theory of international relations. And so people aren't really shocked that it's happening, but still you're a little disappointed when you see China, you know, kind of using this added, not just economic, but military and diplomatic heft to, you know, to show off its, its muscle. And South China Sea, of course, has been an area where that's been most obvious. And, you know, you get countries like Vietnam, which is a fellow Communist Party controlled country where, you know, there's, uh, I don't know what the Pew numbers say, uh, but I did have a chance to spend a little bit of time in Vietnam. And, you know, it's it's no secret that there's a, a very strong feeling in Vietnam of concern about China and that it's a threat. It's encroaching on Vietnamese economic interests, you know, and that it's it's not good for Vietnam, for Southeast Asia, for the region to have, you know, this kind of all powerful China. I, I suppose the other big one, and maybe this is stronger for the United States, European countries, but others who, you know, in liberal democratic societies, which also have traditions of caring about human rights and commenting on human rights situations in other countries. That has gone backward by any measure. When you look at mass scale detention of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and the way in which, you know, young people, students have been treated and others have been treated in Hong Kong who are seeking, you know, not, not separatists, but seeking to maintain the kind of autonomy and openness and freedom that, again, in, in the Deng package had been assured to Hong Kong for at least, what was it, 50 years, you know, to, to have that roll back and forcefully and um, kind of pridefully, you know, I mean, there's a real, when you look at the messaging around Hong Kong, it's sort of how dare they. So these are just sort of off the top of my head. I mean, I think uh, if you look across the board with, with those as the most prominent ones, and, and Tibet as well, Tibet has not gotten the same kind of newfound attention as has uh, the situation with Uyghurs. But from every account, it's just as bad, maybe in a different way in terms of Tibetan autonomy and religious freedom and looking forward to the what will happen with the succession of the Dalai Lama. So I had long ago, you know, accepted as, as someone who comes from a liberal democratic society and, and believes that that is the least bad of all systems. I didn't have a model where I saw China heading toward that because it was increasingly capitalist, you know. So this is this, this has not been some sudden shock. Wow, China is not going to democratize. But within my set of expectations, you know, and kind of going back to when Orville Shell and I finished Wealth and Power, I mean, I wouldn't have expected these things to go so far backward. Whatever the exact number of Uyghurs detained or put in camps you know, that that is sort of a feature of Maoist rule, not Deng era rule. So that is a case of 
of really going backwards by the standards of PRC history. So I, I think that's where, if I were filling out the survey, the line would be going down for me. And, and I think that, you know, I'm not the only one who sees those things and feels that way. South Korea has oftentimes been described as a country stuck in the middle of a potential great powers geopolitical clash, the proverbial shrimp caught between two whales. Geographically, South Korea is located near and economically tied to China. Yet, it is also allied to the United States. Last time we talked in 2016, President Pagane was still in office. During her presidency, Sino-Korean relations reached a low point as Korea had accepted the placement of the US THAAD missile defense system in South Korea. Beijing feared the system would not only be aimed at North Korea, its official target, but also at China. A year later, Park was impeached and Moon Jae-in was elected president. How would you characterize President Moon Jae-in's approach to China? Well, it is very interesting to go back. I, I would suggest we go back a little bit before the last time we talked, because to see this trajectory, we have to remember that before the THAAD debacle, Korea, China, South Korea, China relations were at arguably an all time peak, at least at the political level. You know, you'll recall Park Geun Hye stood up there on the balustrade of Tiananmen Square. Uh, I think it was Putin was maybe the only person ahead of her next to Xi to celebrate the anniversary of the victory over Japan. And she stood there for a military parade. It's it quite a remarkable moment. That was years, the first few years of her presidency, she was very focused on improving ties with China kind of to that pinnacle. And then within six months, you know, it went from that peak and a very close relationship. I mean, if you go back, you look at the reporting, Park Geun-hye was, was sort of the BFF of Xi Jinping. I mean, it, she was his closest political kind of friend out there, at least in terms of symbolism. And then you go from that to that, you know, to 2016, as you described. So I think if we keep that in mind, I would put Moon somewhere in the middle. It was hard to make the relationship worse when he came in. He came in with the, you know, heaviest economic coercive measures in place by China to punish South Korea for having agreed to the THAAD deployment. And, you know, living through that, my sense at the time, again, South Koreans weren't shocked. Uh, so I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding from the outside that this, that the THAAD moment was this kind of shocking moment for South Korea. It, it more confirmed the worst expectations, but they were, you know, well within the realm of what was kind of expected that, yeah, China's going to do this. And when, and when they have these pressure points on us, they're going to use them and they've decided to use them. So it was highly unpopular. It certainly added to the negativity toward China in South Korea. And then it also accelerated both political, but more importantly, I think, economic shifts that were already underway. And Moon continued those, which was, you know, it's sort of a natural response was for South Korea to diversify away from China as far as its trade dependency and business relationships and investment relationships. And, you know, that's hard to do when you're geographically and uh, economically as far as the symmetry has been quite good for South Korea to benefit a lot from China's growth, just as China has benefited. It's been a mutually highly beneficial relationship. But you saw with Moon an acceleration of, you know, the new Southern policy which is, there was nothing new about it, but what was new is, you know, more was actually happening. And Moon was very focused on that, making visits. I think at one point, pre-corona, of course, he had visited every ASEAN country, if I'm remembering right. And uh, Vietnam was central to that in terms of, you know, again, this was more than Summitry, uh, Samsung's largest production facility at a certain point was uh, in Vietnam. And uh, you could really see that I could see that shift happening at the ground level in South Korea. And that's, you know, part of a recalibration. So Moon was doing two things at the same time. He was, he's also been, even in the Trump era, and not given enough credit, I don't think, for what a loyal ally he was to the United States and tried very hard to uh, minimize the kind of collateral damage that Trump could have done. I mean, if you look at what 
Donald Trump said about South Korea at his rallies. I mean, you know, fortunately, the media only carried the North Korea part which was love letters. But then he would talk about South Korea and how it's free riders and, you know, why are we even there? And Moon put a lot of effort into protecting the alliance relationship uh, and keeping goodwill. Um, But of course, that was, uh, I think he genuinely believes in it, but it was also out of national self-interest. At the same time that he did he did some work to repair the damage with China at the low point that it was at when he came in. You know, he made a visit to Beijing in which he was sort of not treated very nicely, but he just kind of stiff upper lipped it. He did what he had had to do, you know. And so the relationship improved and kind of stabilized. At the same time, you know, if we look back on Moon's heading into his last year, his focus has not been improving relations with China. He doesn't want to damage the relationship. But interestingly, Puck and Hay put a lot more effort and poli- spent a lot more political capital trying to kind of dramatically improve the relationship and get closer with China. Moon's, there's a certain coolness to it. Um, so that's how I would characterize it overall. And it's at this stage fairly stable, the ties. If you were to speculate, why this coolness? What is different between President Park and President Moon? Well, again, some of it is, you know, the hands that you're dealt. And so he was, you know, she, when, when Pac came into power, she saw an opportunity to, um, a little earlier in the Xi era, uh, U.S.-China tensions were not as um, sharp. So she had room, uh, you know, to maneuver as a conservative. She also, you know, there's a little of the Nixon in China effect where she had room. And so she um, she saw that that opening and kind of went for it. Um, whereas by the time, you know, so Moon Jae-in may have done a similar thing, quite honestly, because I, I don't see a strong ideological component uh, for either of them, you know, this conservative leader and liberal leader. Um, and when I have discussions about China in Korea, I don't find as strong as sharp a divide between a liberal and a conservative, uh, which is interesting. Then on other issues where it's it's pretty obvious, I can tell within a minute, uh, you know, where they are, just like they could probably tell with me. But with with China, um, you know, it's uh, I guess uh, there's more bipartisanness uh, to it, and so I, I don't know. Moon may have done a similar thing, but when he came in. I think it was kind of obvious in terms of the the um, the interest of the country was you needed to improve that relationship. You d- didn't want to keep it at that level, and so he did the work. But uh, he didn't want to go back to standing on Tiananmen Square, you know. And I, I guess the other we do have to bring in North Korea here because you know part of it is um, as we're seeing unfold now, um, you know, any leader you've got limited time and and resources and there's some issues that you care a lot more about than others both for the politics of it your perceived political gain uh and there can be ideology or values or your personal history you know moon jae in is it could be shocking when i say this cares a lot about the north korea issue and the inner korean issue you know and, and that's what he wants his legacy to be um and we saw that in all its glory in 2018, and then it's kind of fallen apart, and we'll see what's possible in this last year. So with that focus on trying to achieve a breakthrough in the inner Korean peace, China is kind of secondary to that. Now, Pak geun didn't have that same kind of prioritization. You know, I, I think she cared a lot more, actually, about the China peace uh, than about the inner Korean peace. So that's a fundamental difference between the two of them. It seems that every so often, tensions arise between the South Korean and Chinese publics over cultural and historical items, for example, regarding controversial statements by K-pop stars, or over issues like the alleged origin of kimchi. Do you think that Beijing and Seoul are responsive to those controversies? Or is it more of a, a background noise that they may pay lip service to, but they don't really care about? And in the mood, at least Seoul, you know, the government here, in my assessment, has avoided stirring the pot on the kind of 
culture war that's latent there, if you want to have it, with China. Uh, because, you know, China and Korea know each other well. There's a lot of Chinese people here. There's a lot of Korean people in China, whether you're talking about students, business people across the board. And you've got thousands of years of history, you know, and they have a lot of common cultural touchstones, but then totally different modern histories, you know, and Korea got wealthier much earlier and remains per capita uh, significantly wealthier than China across the board, has had these kind of extraordinary cultural successes with K-pop and BTS and Parasite. I guess Americans consider Minari also a Korean film. And China doesn't have that kind of trajectory in terms of culturally as well. I mean, for China's rise kind of goes back to earlier parts of our conversation. I can't think of, you know, what's the Chinese BTS or Parasite, right? What's the kind of cultural product that really captured the world's imagination and became this huge hit, you know, and, and BTS and Parasite are just too and kind of known to Americans. You you go to Southeast Asia, other parts of the world, they know a lot of bands and TV shows that came before that. So there's a lot of room for for low grade culture war between China and Korea. And it is kind of always there at some level. And I, I noticed it seemed to me a pattern recently, I guess, of it seemed like the quote unquote Chinese side was picking fights. I couldn't figure out why. It's it's also hard to know. You look at something like Global Times, you know, Huancho Shibao. And I, I've been a reader of Huancho Shibao since my early visits to China, you know, uh, and I, I know some of their, I've known some of their actually superb reporters. They can do some serious journalism, but then they also you know, have this kind of hyper-nationalist tabloid aspect to them. And they're a strange mixture of market and state as well. So it's it's hard to know actually how to interpret when Global Times is playing up how kimchi is actually Chinese. How much is that because it's getting a lot of clicks in China versus Beijing, you know, has sent a signal, come on, we gotta we got to rough up the Koreans a little bit. I can't say that I've figured out the patterns. But my sense on the Korean side is kind of, as with that, it's like stand our ground, but not stir the pot more than we need to. That seems to be kind of the MO. What about the United States position between South Korea and China? Do you think the new administration in DC will actually make a difference in this equation? What about South Korea in between the U.S. and China? So I, I like your question. What about the, the U.S. in between South Korea and China? And uh, yes, the new administration and the course that Sino-U.S. relations take over the next four years is going to have a big impact here. I mean, South Korea is, you know, is positioned, again, usually the, the framing is South Korea in between the two. And there's a lot of that manifests at an economic level, you know, where South Korean made or connected, you know, products are partially produced in China and then sold to the United States. But, you know, if there's a trade war, South Korea hurts, you know, South Korean companies hurt because of their involvement in the Chinese economy. And th that was one prominent feature, for example, in the Trump era, when we saw a real kind of trade war emerging and significant tariffs being levied. There were regular stories in the Korean press with numbers about how that was hurting Korea. So, you know, that's one very material example. And it's kind of early days to tell where the trade relationship is going to go. But that can very, that does directly affect Korea. And then on the security side, I mean, we're already seeing as we speak, the US secretaries of state and defense are here in Seoul. Today, I think is the big day of discussions. But in, in signaling and previewing the their visit, the American side has, uh, they were in Tokyo and, and on the way over here. And the first comments very much stressed China, 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 you know, China threat, China challenge, and we're rallying our allies because we have something that the Chinese don't, which is each other. We've got these alliances. So uh, that's on the security and diplomacy side of the equation where the early signals of this administration is that, you know, they want to rally allies and partners to present this kind of united front against 
China on human rights issues, some of the things we talked about before, and also on hard security issues in the maritime domain, on cyber. You know, the list is pretty long and growing. That manifests as pressure on South Korea. Now, it may be pressure that the South Koreans actually maybe not want, but need. It's not necessarily, it, it can look like tension in the alliance, but I, it might be a productive tension in the sense that South Korea standing on its own can't really turn to China, which is next door and much bigger, and say, quit what you're doing in Hong Kong. But if the United States is taking a lead and working with a lot of other countries who all say, hey, quit, we really don't like what you're doing in Hong Kong. And you know, and you're you're damaging your global reputation. It's bad for finance. You know, cool off. We know we're you know we're not supporting separatism here in South Korea. South Koreans identify with Hong Kong. The 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 cultural style and the openness of Hong Kong is very familiar to South Koreans. You know, and they would like to see mainland become more like Hong Kong rather than vice versa. So that's a a message that someone like Moon Jae In would agree to. But you know, he's not going to make that stand on his own. And so that's there. <laughs> This is where skillful diplomacy is required, but it ultimately, again, could be a kind of productive tension in the alliance. One of the big topics in the relations between South Korea and China has for decades been, well, North Korea, and specifically how the international community should interact with it. To briefly talk about North Korea here. You wrote a couple of weeks ago in an article that North Korea, and I quote, slogged through 2020, that it, and I quote again, remained inwardly focused, and that it largely ignored the recent overtures from the South and the new administration in the United States. From the perspective of someone like yourself, who is part of both the public and the academic discourse on North Korea, was the past year just boring? Um... Yes. And I again, I've been joking with my students about how the last year was boring. And that was a good thing, particularly for a historian, you know, and our class looking at the history and politics of North Korea. You know, when you're not kind of drinking from the fire hose of missile tests and summits and all of the drama of 2017 and 2018, actually both the last two years, 2019 and 2020, after Hanoi, much quieter. And um, you see different things, you know, you 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 still look at it. So you see maybe more of the subtleties, you focus more, your analysis becomes more inwardly focused. I mean, you look at it more at internal dynamics and what is Kim Jong-un saying, for example, to the Politburo? What is he saying to his public? As opposed to what is he writing in his love letter to Donald Trump, which is sort of perforce what we were focusing on prior to that. And so it was boring in a illuminating way. It, it would appear to me that we may be seeing the end Literally, just yesterday and today may be the end of the boring phase <laughs> because there had been no comment to the Biden administration until yesterday, really. I know it was sort of direct comment, but now it feels a little bit like we're off to the races. Not that I know where it's going to go by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it seems to be moving again, you know, and there's kind of statements and, and stuff to analyze. And so less boring, but also all of our analytical problems come back as well, you know, and we read everything in terms of us and we misread a lot. Yeah, it's possible it's very early, but we'll see. But it seems like boring is over. Where does China fit in here? The country is North Korea's only partner. At the same time, you wrote in 2019, in the context of Xi Jinping's visit to Pyongyang that, and I quote, China is losing its grip over North Korea. And its behavior towards North Korea is driven by, and I quote again, the anxiety that Mr. Kim might be tempted to defect, diplomatically speaking, towards the United States and South Korea. Would you say that this is still an accurate description of China's stance towards Pyongyang? I think it's there. I think the dynamics are, I would describe them as latent now. You know, China-North Korea relations are an enigma wrapped in a mystery or a riddle. What's the phrase? What's the cliche? Uh, but they, they really are 
so much fun to try to puzzle out because you sort of have two, I mean, North Korea, we can describe, describe as fairly opaque. China can be pretty tough to know what, you know, they're really thinking and doing. And then how do they relate to one another? You know, one of the most guarded parts of their generally guarded kind of approach. So there's certainly plenty of guesswork, educated guesswork involved. But if we look at the Kim Jong-un, Xi Jinping era, you know, to do the same kind of exercise, putting it in a mini historical context, the first what was it, six years were extraordinary for how bad that relationship got, for how bad those two leaders let it get. And in my view, most of the agency there was Kim Jong-un. It was mostly Kim Jong-un who was refusing to abide by the kind of lowest expectation of how a Korean leader is supposed to treat the Chinese leader. And again, you had this contrast, don't forget, with Park Geun-hye. Park Geun-hye here is begging for an invite to Tiananmen Square. I mean, I'm exaggerating. Whereas Kim Jong-un is not interested in going to China. And so Park went to Beijing and she visited Seoul. And the commentary focused on what a sort of slap that was to North Korea. I interpreted it very differently. It was the North Korean slap to China that Kim Jong-un was not trying to get a visit or do the minimum he needed to do to get a visit. And she was taking that quite personally and, you know, offended in some political, personal way. So we saw that culminate, you know, 2017, I suppose, was the peak of that, where you had these unprecedented, you had to go back decades to get editorials in the state-controlled North Korean media. And here again, we get into Global Times, but the North Korea pieces in 2017, I'm pretty sure had sign-off. I don't know that, but I would be shocked if there wasn't approval and kind of making sure the messaging was okay because they were just firing back at one another, you know, very harsh editorials. And it was revealing that kind of raw side of how much uh, the Chinese and North Koreans dislike one another and distrust one another, you know, which if you know their history is, is there in a number of key watersheds, their history is underwritten by distrust and dislike actually. Uh, and yet they're allies, China's only ally. That all reverses, you know, that all starts to reverse in 2018. Suddenly, you know, five summits in a year and these guys are best friends and so they papered over it really well and everyone kind of forgets what it had been like for the previous six years. So I think we have to keep in mind both sides of that relationship. Right now, again, especially because there's kind of nothing happening with the Americans and the South Koreans, Kim Jong-un is, uh, he's holding on to the gains that he made. I think that's how he would understand it. You know, it's not that she tightened his grip on Kim, it's that Kim decided, okay, now I'm ready for our symmetry. And so he's kind of maintaining that. But I guess the way I'd put it is I would not underestimate the distrust and dislike that remains present in their dynamics. And uh, it's just kind of situationally activated. If there's an opening for Kim Jong-un, and by that I'm referring primarily to another round of diplomacy with the United States and South Korea, I'd expect him to take it. Not He's not desperate to take it, but he'll look to take it. And a big part of that will be that gives him breathing room, allows him, just like everyone else, to diversify away from dependency on China. Uh, he's not under the gun to do that, but over the long run, he'll. I would expect him to look for that and to take that opportunity if he sees it. In 2016, we spoke to you about the history of Sino-North Korean relations. And at the time, you used the word sade the idea of serving the great, to describe one characteristic of how the two countries have related to each other for century. Based on your response, is it fair to say that the time for serving the great is just over, that it's not a dynamic we'll see in Sino-North Korean relations anymore? Well, I'm still teaching it. In fact, I taught it yesterday in my class. So evidently, I don't think its utility is completely spent because I think you actually could describe the current new status quo in those terms. Because remember, the corollary of serving the great is that the, the greater power, the bigger state protects the smaller state. Just bring back what I just said, which is that Kim Jong-un, we, we shouldn't assume this just goes on in perpetuity. I think that we saw him in his initial years, he rejected Sade. He refused to abide by it. And I'm not sure how in the long run sustainable this is because it's there's not enough trust in that relationship. I don't think it's comfortable enough relationship where 
the North Koreans will continue to kind of essentially operate under China's shadow, assuming that they'll be protected because I, I don't think they trust Chinese assurances enough. It could last a while though, if there's, again, like it could last the whole Biden administration. And here's where US-China relations come into play because if, if US-China relations are, are just continue to move in a negative direction, a very acrimonious and hostile, and plus the Biden administration shows no serious outreach to North Korea, then I think if you're Kim, you basically ride it out with some version of what I would describe as sade, sade jui, which of course the North Koreans don't listen to your podcast. I, I assume they would hate to hear them described as that because they always use that to say, not always, but they will occasionally insult South Korea for its sade jui vis-a-vis -vis the United States. They, they would not like to hear them their own foreign policy strategy being described as sade toward China. But I, I think that is okay as a framework uh, for what's going on now. You mentioned a certain distrust between Pyongyang and Beijing. Why is that? Why don't they seem to trust each other? Well, it's got deep historical roots. You know, at a at a conceptual level, it's a root. It's rooted in the histories of communist movements in Asia, in particular, where of course communism has survived. It's gone out pretty much everywhere else, but it made it here. And one reason it, it survived in, you know, quote unquote, serious countries like China, Vietnam, and North Korea is because it was from the beginning so intensely nationalistic, you know, and, and had this post-colonial or anti-imperialist element to it. But what that meant is that there were rivalries, you know, and and resentment and distrust among the communist parties and the nation states within Asia itself. You know, so the classic example of this is Sino-Vietnamese relations. I mean, I always point out that one of the best books I know of in the English language on nationalism, just any of all the books written about nationalism, I'd say probably the best one I know is Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson. And he starts that as academics like to with, with a puzzle of why did, why did China just invade Vietnam? Why did communist China just invade communist Vietnam? You know, after having backed the Vietnamese for decades in their struggle against the French and then against the Americans. And here, what happens within years of North Vietnamese, communist Vietnam, Vietnam's triumphant reunification, you get China sending troops across the border, you know, the, the basically the one invasion of the Dung era. And at some simple level, it's because nationalism trumps communism. And that logic applies in the Sino-Korean, in the history of that relationship, in the kind of the, at the bedrock ideology. And, you know, I think we talked about in the last podcast, so we can send, we can send listeners back to, uh, to our first episode. But, you know, there, there have been these critical moments, not obscure moments, but sort of defining moments in North Korean history and Sino-Korean history, where I guess from a North Korean perspective, China did not back them up. And then China tells that history as well as one in which the North Koreans are constantly asking for more than they deserve, not grateful for the help they're getting. You know, it goes all the way back to the fighting of the Korean War and you get it at these kind of key moments in their relationship. The, I suppose the last really big one would be the 1990s when China normalized relations with South Korea purely out of its self-interest, you know, political, diplomatic, economic self-interest, very good move for China, did nothing, nothing to somehow keep North Korea's interests in mind as it made that move. And, you know, that was really a knife in the back if you're North Korea. So both sides have long memories. Uh, it's, it's kind of a well-established pattern in their relationship that they can't fundamentally trust one another. And again, at this ideological level, even though they're both communist party states, the ideological glue has always been weak, even you know more so now. Uh, and that's kind of the short answer of why they, they don't trust one another. If we step away from day-to-day -day politics, a connection between North Korea and China has, by many observers, been seen in how the former might want to copy the developmental model of the latter. Half a year after Kim Jong-un came to power in the summer of 2012, you wrote that his approach, and I quote, shows signs of increasing pragmatism, experimentalism, and transparency. 
hallmarks of China's epic shift from Mao to Deng. Looking back at this observation, and with the knowledge of today, do you think that North Korea has in fact, well, been adopting a Chinese-inspired approach to its economic development? Yes and no. I, I basically stand by that piece. It's one of the few pieces, mostly if anyone brings up anything I've written, it's that piece to be like, nah, 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 you know. Um, but I, the, the real shocker is I pretty much think I was right. The main point there was very early on in that stage I saw in Kim Jong-un that, that he was focused on economic development, that he wanted to make a shift from his father's uh, so-called military first politics to a economic development kind of orientation. And that was the key similarity to Dump. And then those three features, experimentation, pragmatism, transparency, transparency may be too strong a word. For example, by transparency, what, what we all saw as observers early on, which continues to be borne out, is that uh, unlike in his father and, and late grandfather's era, there's some precedence for it, but Kim Jong-un was remarkable in openly admitting failure. That's the point about transparency, you know, and saying like the first satellite test didn't work and he didn't pretend it didn't work. He, you know, they, they announced it didn't work. We're going to do it again in December. And then they, they succeeded in December. And we've continued to see that both the focus on the economy and a kind of pragmatism, we have to do better talking about what's not working. Even recently, if you remember, he was crying in the parade in October in Pyongyang, why was Kim Jong-un crying? He was crying because it were tears of sort of apology that he and the party had not done a good enough job in terms of fulfilling the, his promises that the economy would develop in the face of you know COVID, but also uh, they did have bad weather last year and uh, and ongoing sanctions, and so. You know, there's a lot of acknowledgement on Kim Jong Un's part that it's not working, and we have to come up with a formula that will work. And I do see those as dungus. The fact that he 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 does keep saying you should judge me on economic development, and that's dungus. And then he's uh, relatively speaking pragmatic about you know uh, there need to be results here. Now, where my thinking has really changed about this. And where I can see I was missing something is I've kind of moved away from forcing the Dung comparison. Maybe it's in part because the changes we discussed earlier in Xi's China being so different from Dung's China, but also, you know, North Korea has really done a lot of the things that happened in China in the 70s and 80s. And, and Kim Jong-un did accelerate that process in that he did not come in and like his father had done, kind of hope to recreate the orthodox command economy. He's basically allowed the markets to continue to go. It's not a capitalist paradise by any stretch, but there has been under his, in his era, there's been this greater kind of stabilization of a certain degree of marketization of the North Korean economy has become a, a norm, an accepted feature of how things work. And again, that's a, that's a lot of what happened under Dung. And I think to a great extent, that process is actually complete. Meanwhile, China itself, as I mentioned before, for a while now, has been focused on shifting from market to state. You know, and how do you build national champions? How does the state maintain its control over the commanding heights of the economy in terms of technology, in strategic areas of industry? And so, I think that Kim Jong Un, I, I don't think he's waking up in the morning saying. How can I be like Xi, uh, Deng Xiaoping today? I don't think he ever thought of it that explicitly, but I think there was this kind of developmental um, strongman model for him, like Pak Chung Hee as well. But already, I think we're in a different phase. I think now Kim and Xi have more sort of similarities, you know. And if there's a China model that Kim Jong Un is aware of and thinking about, okay, how do I use that here in North Korea? It's Xi's model more than it is Deng's model. The last thing I would say to a, a kind of new piece of evidence to show, in this case, a more explicit example of how Kim is modeling North Korea's governance and economic management on the, the Chinese model is the fact that they just had this party congress, you know, and the most important thing I still think so far, the party congress is that they had it at all. 
on a five-year schedule. And according to Kim Jong-un, that's how it's going to work from now on. Every five years, they're going to have the party Congress. And in that Congress, he stressed the economy and how are we going to, we need a better five-year plan, has to be more realistic. And we have to uh, achieve the goals of this five-year plan because we didn't succeed in achieving the goals of the previous one. That's what China and Vietnam do. They have party congresses every five years that deal with, you know, the kind of whole sweep of issues, but especially are focused on the five-year planning, economic planning mechanism. And so that I I think is a very good recent example of how Kim Jong-un is trying to kind of move North Korea in more into the mold of his peer states among the Asian communist countries. As you mentioned earlier, a big thing about Deng was his focus on making sure that it would be a transition and a succession. Are we likely to see a Chinese style succession system being set up in North Korea? Or is that something that will remain hereditary? Well, I wouldn't put it past Kim Jong-un that he breaks the model of hereditary succession. You know, I'll, I'll say that now. It's March 18th, 2021, and that can be used uh, against me in 25 years, or I can be proclaimed as a prophet. But again, I'm not precluding that possibility just to hedge this properly. And uh, he's got models there. I mean, another interesting kind of model for him would be Taiwan, actually, Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist Party, which is not given enough credit for being uh, a Leninist party at its core, like the Chinese and Korean and Vietnamese communist parties. And, you know, Chiang Kai-shek had essentially set up a hereditary state uh, and party in Taiwan and had been grooming uh, his son, Jiang Jingguo, for a long time. And uh, so that when Chiang Kai-shek died in 1975, Jiang Jingguo was the leader of Taiwan. But Jiang Jingguo made the transition. Now, in his case, all the way, essentially, he paved the, the way for Taiwan to emerge as what it is now, a genuine multi-party liberal democratic country. I wouldn't expect that in my wildest dreams of Kim Jong-un, but I wouldn't be surprised if he transitions away from hereditary succession towards some kind of party, you know, some, some variation on the Chinese and Vietnamese model of a party. Still, Communist Party successions are, are problematic for the Chinese and the Vietnamese. But we should keep in mind that when North Korea was created, to the best of my historical knowledge, it was not founded as a hereditary system. That came later at some point when Kim Il-sung decided, okay, I guess I'm going to give this to my kid. It's not in the constitution. It is not a de jure monarchy. It is a de facto one. And of course, there's a huge amount of cultural, uh, the political culture is invested in that symbolically with the Pekdu bloodline. But all of these are euphemisms. Even Kim Jong-un himself is never referred to as the son and grandson of the leaders. And it, there was an incredible moment where he did it once, where he referred to himself. He referred to Kim Jong-il as, uh, as his father, which was quite unprecedented. So my point is they've actually left themselves room to cease to be a hereditary state and say, we never, it's not in the constitution. You know, it's who, whoever said that. I know it sounds fanciful. They may have no choice if his heirs are not, you know, of age, if something happens to him. And uh, again, I wouldn't put it, wouldn't put it past him. When we first interviewed you in 2016, you told us about how your interest in China goes back to your teenage years in the United States. As someone who has had a personal as well as an academic interest in China for decades, how do you feel about China's path forward? The country seems to get more and more authoritarian, its international standing seems to be getting worse, and its economic future is still somewhat uncertain. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the years to come? You know, in very personal terms, as a China scholar, a student of Chinese history and admirer of Chinese philosophy and culture, and someone with friendships, you know, over the years, I guess even decades in China, just at my micro level, I feel sadness for myself. I know China's fine. They're, they're going to do what they're going to do. I mean, they're 1.4 billion people figuring things out. And I'm aware, I'm aware of knowing less and less about what is really going on over there. You know, the, the ways in which our technology and how we communicate with one another, the, the gulf has been increasing and the acrimony 
in US-China relations, which the United States is also responsible for, you know, affects at a personal level where I, I go to China less. And now, of course, COVID has hit. So I, I don't know what the post-COVID world is going to be like, but already I was traveling to China less. And I've felt in the last year or two, like I have less idea of what's going on on the ground there. You know, some of the best reporters, American journalists were expelled, uh, some of whom I know. And I know they're very, they're just incredibly knowledgeable people. They're fair people. They were doing good reporting. And I would always read their stuff because it would help me, you know, just just kind of keep a sense and and sometimes read very interesting things. And, and um, we've lost those windows, you know, there is this kind of reversion. I mean, for my, my main book manuscript work these days is on the 1950s and there's eerie ways in which I see parallels. It's like U S China relations are heading back to the early fifties when American journalists couldn't visit China. No U S citizen was permitted to visit by the state department to visit China. And I hate that word decoupling. I hate it because it's appropriate, you know, coupling in a friendship way the human bonds that form, those get uprooted and disrupted, you know, and as kind of societies, we know less and less about one another. So in my very small little world, I I feel that I see the toll. It's kind of taking my own, I would say, affection for China hasn't really been changed by it. I mean, I feel if I go over and pick up my tattered copy of Zhuangzi, I'll start giggling and, you know, I'll read the Analects and maybe not giggle, but love that too. And I, I remain just as fascinated and, and curious to learn and to understand in terms of history and culture uh, and thought. And, and the last thing I would say is, you know, cases like, um, they're on my mind because it's just been announced there will be sentencing of these two Canadians, one of whom I know a tiny bit, the other many of my friends know, the, the two Michaels, you know, the Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, you know, a case like that where they've been held for over a year, is it now, on espionage charges and in not good conditions and who knows what's going to happen with the sentencing, you know, but you, you sort of, it's ominous. It's quite ominous, you know, and it makes engagement with China as an expert feel, uh, I don't know, I felt uncomfortable going to China while they were imprisoned. And I feel your solidarity is always, for better or worse, increased when it's someone who you know or feel kind of like you. You know, I mean, Kovrig is working for an international NGO. I didn't know him, but I know plenty of people in that organization. You know, and so for folks like that to be treated in that way, it's made me much less keen to visit China. I know it's affected a lot of people in the field that way. And so if those trends continue, that will make me even more sad. There's a certain sadness to these developments. So um, it's not really optimism or pessimism at this point, but there's increasing sadness. But I'm a hopeful guy, so look for ways to to turn it around and at least avoid the worst case outcomes. Professor Delury, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Alan. There's such great questions. I mean, I really think you're the only person out there reading any of the stuff I write. So for that alone, I'm so grateful to be able to, to talk to you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episodes, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or with any podcast app, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For more information and our archive with all previously released episodes, please visit our website.